Top, but let's say in the top two <laughs> international <laughs> researchers in work harder, work harder. Depending on which week you ask. Uh, in, uh, in character animation, um, he is well acknowledged, has a, a long history of, of posing some wonderful ideas um, in, in animation. Uh, he founded what's uh, arguably the, the top animation conference in the field, uh, Symposium Computer Animation, back in 2002. And uh, I was very lucky to have him as uh, co-chair um, just this past summer, where we had another successful symposium on computer animation. I think he's hosted something like five other conferences on top of that. 
Um, he's gotten involved with startup companies. He has students uh, who've gone on to film companies. His, his tendrils of research have reached all sorts of places. Um, just on a personal note, he's, he's been a wonderful mentor. And I think, I don't know of anyone else who after, say, cycling up and down the three North Shore mountains and then maybe around Richmond to top it off, still has more infectious energy than I don't know anyone else. So, with that, please. Great. Uh, great. Is the uh, audio working? Okay, that sounds good. All right. Great. Many thanks for the, for the introduction, Robert. I don't know how I can uh, live up to that introduction, but uh, let's get started. So I've titled, titled this talk, the, the Language of Motion, as you can see. So you might wonder, well, what's the connection between language and motion? So, uh, so let's, uh, let's look at some possible connections. So if we're, interesting, if we're interested in building models of motion, one of the first things that we might want to do is collect some data regarding motion. And so, so that's changed over the years, all the way from, uh, I, I think this is uh, from the uh, Chauvet uh, uh, caves in France. So this is about 20,000 years ago. So we go from this, 20,000 year years of progress for, for depicting human motion. There we go, Mickey Mouse. Um, through to, to, to current kind of technologies for, for capturing motion. So the um, basic technology for, uh, for doing stroboscopic photography actually developed at the same time as, as uh, film came, came into being. And, um, and so, so was, and, and these two are only, are only maybe uh, uh, 80 years apart or so, or in terms of being able to, to collect data for, for documenting motion. Now, um, these are very literal depictions of motion. And so if we're going to build a, a, a language of motion, what we need to do is to develop ways to, to abstract motions. And so, so these are all actually different notation systems uh, for motions, believe it or not. And uh, with, with one exception, so this is your, uh, your, your wake-up test and your, your warm-up test. So, so one of these four diagrams is actually not a notation system for, for motion. And so, uh, so you have to guess which. <laughs> Any takers? People in, in people in my 526 course are, are not allowed to guess because I already run this <laughs> quiz for them. But <laughs> the spiral thing on the right. Okay, so we, we, we have one vote for for this not being motion. So so it turns out um, th th this is actually not, not a notation for motion. That this is a t uh, notation written notation for a Tibetan Tibetan chant. Um, <laughs> it's true, believe it or not. Um, anyhow, so, so, uh, th so these are, are, are very abstract uh, notations uh, for motion. Um, they're primarily better for, uh, for taking an existing motion and abstracting it. Um, however, if you're, a, if you're a dancer, for example, then you can take some of these uh, notation systems which have often been developed for a ballet, for example, and, and you can read this as, in the same way that you would read a musical score and actually uh, instantiate that motion or, or some version thereof. And so uh, these are models of motion. And uh, of course, uh, one of the most interesting things you can do is, is actually to build a, a model of motion that you can actually execute. And so, so that you can drive this abstraction not only from data going in this, in this direction, but also going from the abstraction back down to, to synthesizing data, right? So, so this, is, this going up is analysis and going down is, is synthesis. And uh, as with many problems, uh, we're interested in, in, in doing, being able to do both analysis and synthesis. Um, although I'll argue that in the case of motion, doing synthesis is, um, is a challenging and still open problem. So uh, there are also some intermediate notations for the, uh, uh, there's notations that are of intermediate complexity, and so, so this is kind of half literal and, and half abstraction. It, it, it's partway abstracted. So, um, so th th this is just a simple keyframe motion of a ball. And so, so you can imagine that, that because it's only being partly abstracted, that this you can actually generate a motion from. And uh, this is actually a, a diagram from, uh, from a karate manual. And so just to give you some flavor of, of, of some degree of abstraction happening there. All right, so what we'd like to do is, um, is build models that can also do synthesis. And so um, we can generally, generally take two paths in order to do this. So, so one is to, is to build a kinematic model. And in a kinematic model, we don't take the forces into account. 
So in a kinematic model, um, I can jump off the ground and float across to the other side of the room and set myself back down. So we're, we're free to do uh, more arbitrary motions. On the other hand, it, it's actually easier to build uh, models over on this side. And so, so one example of a, a vocabulary that you might use to build a kinematic model is to you go into your motion capture studio, you perform some motions. We'll segment that motion into uh, contiguous clips. And then we can resequence those clips and or blend those cl clips uh, in order to produce new motions. All right? So it, it, it's, it, it is an abstract representation, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really still a very little representation. Um, now, now the limitations on this side are that it's, it's very difficult to capture all possible motions in the world. And so, so there's a scalability problem over here. So one way in which you can try to tackle this is to use physics. And so, so, so this is being used with, with amazing success in, in other areas of animation. And so if you see any feature film today, uh, it will be uh, generally full of uh, feature effects such as uh, the simulation of water and the simulation of cloth, uh, simply because th th that turns out to be the easiest way to create realistic uh, animations of those phenomena. But for, um, for character animation, we have this control box over here. And um, so, because if we just do physics, we just get a ragdoll motion. And, and that's not very interesting. We want to do uh, more realistic motions. And so, we need to figure out what goes in that control box. And so, um, just like on the kinematic side, we had our motion clip library. Over here, we'll need to develop some kind of skills library or, or some kind of vocabulary of, of uh, parts and, and motion skills. Um, from which to design motions. And, and, and so one of the questions, the big open question for me is, is well, well, what goes in that library? Right? So, so um, how do we build these things? So um, just uh, by, by way of motivation, let me, let me show you a squirrel. <laughs> We've all seen these critters. <laughs> they're, uh, they're incredibly agile in the way they move. And so, um, so if, you're, uh, if you're someone in biomechanics and, neuro and, neurobiolo and neurobiology and you say, oh, I'd like to understand how that squirrel moves, you'd say, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll study it. And uh, I'll collect lots of data um, and study it in, in a variety of ways. Um, so it, it, and so um, if I'm a, if I'm a uh, person on the robotic side of things, I'll say, oh, it's a squirrel. And to learn how squirrels work, you've got to build it, right? So, uh, so the philosophy, so, so, so the, it, these, this is just, just some very crude cartoon characterization of, 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 of the, what the motto of these different fields might be, right? And so, um, so in animation, of course, you know, I, I could say, well, animate it is, is the motto, um, but, that, but that wouldn't be too interesting. So um, in animation, what, what happens is, is, is that uh, we, can, we can draw from, from both of these fields and uh, we have actually considerable freedom to explore, um, partly because we can work with, uh, with certain ideas which, which, you might not, which you might not be able to build yet, but we don't have to worry about actually building it. Um, on the, uh, by the same token, if, if we want to use some data over here uh, um, to, to help drive our motions uh, or some principles over here, we're free to, to borrow from those as well. Um, and at, uh, um, over here, often to, to, to publish in this area, you, you really have to stick very close to something that, that can be verifiable um, on, on a real animal or, or a real human being. Um, whereas over here, we can say, well, uh, ultimately, I, I'm not, I, I, we're only interested in the general principles because in the end, I might be interested in, in, in animating a dinosaur. And well, you know, the, the, the motion data on dinosaurs, it's, it's rather sparse, right? So, so um, so uh, uh, one of the arguments I'll make here is that animation is, is actually a pretty fruitful playground for, for experimenting with ideas re related to motion control. OK. So um, the, the good side was that, um, that motion control is such a broad problem. And of course, the bad side is that motion control is such a broad problem. The, um, so on any given paper or, or, or a problem you might choose to work on, uh, you have to choose an application, okay? So we'll be working on animation. Uh, you have to choose a task. I'll be talking mostly about locomotion and, and balancing. Um, we'll talk about uh, you have to apply it to a certain type of system. Am I animating squirrels or dogs or uh, or uh, or a robot arm that's glued to the ground? Um, 
what kind of method will I be using to, to animate it? And uh, how will I choose to evaluate? I come up with, let's say I fixed all these things and I've come up with some results. How do I evaluate the result? And so, um, so again, so, so depending for any given paper you read in this area, it, it, it produces a point in this space. And, and uh, because it's such a large space, it's, it's often difficult to make the connections between the points in this space. OK. So that's some by, by way of background. The last piece uh, by way of background is uh, just that we're all on the same page here. What we'll be doing is, is building physics-based simulations of motion. So it'll be driven by torques. And then, and then you run the laws of physics, the equations of motion, and you get motion out. We, we want to build this controller box. And so, uh, so here's my character. Um, so what the controller, in general, what, what a controller, uh, the, 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 what the abstract view of the controller is, is it's some policy that takes a state. And so the state here, for mechanical systems, we usually consider the state to be the positions and velocities of all the degrees of freedom. Okay? And so, and so uh, for something like uh, a character like this, it might have, a, I don't know, if you count all the joints in there, maybe there's 14 joints. Each joint can have two or three degrees of freedom, say. Um, and each, for each joint, you have both the angular positions and the angular velocities. And so the, you, know, you, you get to about 78 numbers, say, uh, in order to specify exactly what the position and velocity of this character is. And so in principle, uh, what a control policy does is, is it says, what state are you in? Here's what you need to do. And, and so, so this, uh, this represents, let's pretend that, that this is just driven by simple joint-based actuators. Um, you would need about, about 33 of those. Um, so so if, if your character has, has 33 degrees of freedom that it can drive. Um, anyway, so, so for each state, you need to um, produce this, um, these 33 actions. So if, you're, if, if your control policy were a big table, then you would have to build a 78-dimensional table in principle. And, and it, each entry of that table would, would contain a, a vector of 33 numbers that says, oh, here's what you need to do. Uh, all right. So that's kind of a classical framing of the problem. I, I, I'll actually be arguing that that's a bit of a wrong, a wrong way to frame the problem. But uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So um, I'd like to talk briefly about scalability as well. And so uh, for those of you who were around at the beginning of the talk, I, I just showed a video of the, uh, the, the Petman robot. And so, so uh, people have been trying to build you know, basic walking robots for, for, uh, for at least you know, 40 years. And so, um, so it, uh, a real question is, is, is if it takes 40 years to, to design good, good walking controllers, then then what about all the other motions? You know, I, I want my robot to fold my laundry. I want it to, uh, I want it to wash my dishes, to, to, to load things in my dishwasher. I, 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 want, it, I want all kinds of skills um, to be able to done. We want, we want to be able to create all kinds of skills. And so um, the question is, is surely the, the, long, the solution in the long term can't be to have engineers work on a problem for 40 years and uh, a, a pair of motion scale because it just won't scale. So, so um, learning is, is, a, is a possible answer to this. And so, so, so there's different kinds of learning. So, so, so one kind of learning could be that when I learn how to walk, maybe, maybe what I'll first do, and, and so this is hinting at what I'll be talking about later in the talk, maybe a good point for learning how to walk is, is just, to, just to be able to step in place and not fall over. That's, that's not too hard, right? And so for those of you who have, how many of you have kids? Show of hands. Okay, uh, this is part of that. okay. So fair number. So, so, so kids go through this furniture walking stage, right? And so, so where you have a, a point of support and you slowly walk. Um, and then gradually you can, you can turn that walk into, into a forward unsupported walk. And then once you know how to walk, maybe you, know, maybe you can slowly turn that walk into a run. So, so you have this notion of a developmental strategy behind learning motion skills. And so if you know how to do one skill, often you, you can parlay that into a variety of other skills. So it seems like a trivial thing to say, but, but in practice, I, I, it, it's a really powerful uh, tool. And so, so, that, so if, if, for those of you working on, on machine learning, you'll, you'll say, oh, well, this is a kind of transfer learning. And, uh, and, and that's exactly what it is. So in, another way in which to, to achieve some scalability is, is, to, is to also transfer knowledge 
but through, through a different mechanism. And, and that is, if I build all these skills from some shared vocabulary of parts. Right? And then so, uh, um, so if, there are some, if there are some standard templates that I can, that I can use to construct skills from, um, then the, um, then the, whole, the, the problem of, of designing new motions become, uh, becomes much easier. So now we're back to this language problem of, of, of designing the right vocabulary here and incrementally changing from, in, incrementally adapting skills to, uh, uh, to change them into other skills. So those are actually the, the, the two key themes uh, behind the work that, that, that I'll be showing you. So guiding principles, double star, okay? So, um, so again, incremental learning and, um, and, and uh, yeah, okay, so, so, so incremental learning is one of them. Uh, Phase-based versus state-based representations of control is, is, is the second uh, guiding principle that I'll, that I'll be using. Um, so here's my example of this. So here's an abstraction of what walking and running and transitions between walking and running might look like in, in some kind of arbitrary state space, so, so, so in, in the character state space. So this might be a walk cycle, these large circles. These small circles might be a run cycle. This might be a transition from a walk to a run, and this would be a transition from a run to a walk. There's some variation, it, it, there's some, vari uh, um, some variations, so, so there might be different ways to transition from a walk to a run. This might be I'm walking and then I decide to do a large step and then I go back to walking. So this is kind of an, an abstraction of what's going on in control. And so one of the things you can do is you can say, well, you know what, walking is not a, uh, it's not a uh, 78 dimensional control policy. It's really just doing things as a function of time or, or, or phase as, as what I'll call it. Um, and so you can say, well, walking, you know, it's basically a one dimensional thing. Uh, and if you tell me the phase where I am in my walk cycle, in, in my typical walk cycle, then I can give you uh, the, the 78 numbers that, that are pretty good at describing what that state is. And so, um, and so in this view of the world, well, walking is it's, it's a pretty low dimensional thing, right? So, so, so there's still some variation here because I could be walking a little bit faster than normal. I could be off balance a bit to the left, et cetera. But that's a much lower dimensional space than, than simply looking at the entire state space of the character and, and trying to model within that. Okay, so the, one of the other pieces that we'll need is, is some notion of, of uh, these abstract control templates. And so, um, so what we're gonna do is break up the control into pieces. And so for, for uh, any number of problems, if you can factorize the problem, then, uh, then the problem becomes so much simpler. And so, um, so maybe, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the control for this elbow, or the control for this elbow, maybe it doesn't really, it, it, you know, maybe this particular control action doesn't need to really know what, what this left foot is doing, right? It, so what you do with your right arm might not really need to depend on, on what your left leg is doing. Um, so, so let's do that. We'll, 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 so, so we'll have some very local control templates. Um, we'll also have some state abstraction. So, so um, in terms of deciding, this character needs to decide where to step. One of the um, model, a simple model that's very good for predicting that is, is an inverted pendulum. So if I keep track of the point of support, where is the center of mass? This just looking at this diagram here, it says, well, the inverted pendulum, if this were at rest, it would fall to the left. And so clearly this character, you know, it, it should step over here in order to retain its balance. And so, um, so again, th this is a very compact summarization of the state. And, uh, and, and so the question is, how much can we do with all those kinds of things? Um, a last example here is of uh, um, the, uh, what, what we might decide to do with respect to the vertical. So, so, um, so we might give the character some notion of, of which way is up, and we might decide to use the, the stance hip to, to servo the, the upper body so that no matter what's going on with the, rep, with the rest of the body, perhaps the head and the torso should always be, be uh, a goal for the head and, and the torso should always be to, to be upright, um, irrespective of what the rest of the body is doing. Um, so, so, so these are all various abstractions that, that we'll play with in a second, and, and, and we'll see in a second just how how simple they are and how, um, uh, how many things you, you can do with that. Okay, so, so here's um, um, it, it just, yeah, so, so, so 
I'll be presenting five pieces, uh, uh, five sort snapshots of different pieces of work. Um, here's some work on, on uh, simple biped walking control. And so, so, so this is a method for, a, a very robust method for, for controlling walking. And it's actually inspired by uh, and, and based in part on, on um, some work on, on hopping controllers. So this was, uh, this was uh, out of, out of MI, the MIT Leg Lab in the uh, late 1980s. They built these spectacular hopping robots. They actually used uh, a, a very simple algorithm um, to, decide to, 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 uh, to decide where to place the, where to place the leg for the next hop. So it's using a foot placement strategy. And so, um, and so surprisingly enough, this foot, this foot placement strategy was really only investigated in, in any depth for, for hopping. And I said, well, I don't want to do hopping. I want to do walking. But uh, l l let's just investigate this foot placement strategy for, for walking. So, um, and so, uh, so, so, so let me walk you through the, the, the steps for, constru for constructing a controller for this. So step number one is, is design some cyclic motion. So design a walking puppet. So think of this as a wind up toy. So you can either have some, some little finite state machine or else you can take, uh, you can take one cycle of motion capture data and so pretend you have a wind-up puppet that it doesn't know anything about the world. It, it just does this blindly. You can place it on its back and it'll just do this, right? So that's a, that's the starting point. So step number two is uh, let, let's give this puppet, which can which, which can and will fall over, let's give it some knowledge of which way is up. And so for this character over here, uh, what we'll, what we'll do is is the torso will will you. We'll make use of the stance hip to, to, so that the, uh, the torso should always servo to be upright. So this gives you the nice prop property that even if you fall, so this character is starting to fall backwards, even if it falls, the torso will still remain upright. And you might say, well, well that's not a lot of progress because now it'll fall, but it'll just, you know, it'll, it'll actually, it'll just fall on its bum, but it'll be, you know, its torso will be upright after it's fallen, but, you know, is that progress? Um, but it, it, tur it turns out if you do that, that gives a, a stable frame of reference for, for much of the rest of the motion. And we're starting to, implicitly by doing this, you're starting to add some feedback um, um, around, uh, from some feedback about the world into your control system. All right. So step number three, so this is the foot placement uh, part, says for the, um, uh, we'll do adaptive foot placement, which basically means uh, we're, we're going to place the swing leg where we place the swing leg will no longer be just uh, based upon a, um, upon a, uh, upon a, by a virtual wind-up toy strategy. It will not only just be a function of time, but it will also be a function, a linear function of the position and velocity of the center of mass. So if I told you that this character is, uh, let's pretend this character is at rest in this pose, so with zero velocity, then clearly this character should step, should, step, uh, should step somewhere in front of the character here. So we can modulate that with a gain constant here. Um, if the character, uh, and so we can do the same thing with a velocity. So you can imagine if we're traveling a bit faster than we expected, the foot placement strategy will simply tell you, well, step further ahead, um, and, and, that, and that's a good way to come to a stop or to slow down. So uh, it'll have these two parameters. And, um, and, and, and so that's it. So, 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 so let's see what, what we can do um, with this kind of a strategy. So um, we started out in, uh, in 2D. So uh, let's see here. Let's see if this works here. Uh, this isn't good. All right. Let me, uh, I'm just going to switch modes here. So this all worked fine when I tested it, of course, but uh, uh, oh, did it? Yeah, it did. Shall we give it one more try? Maybe I'm uh, <laughs> maybe I'm just not patient enough. All right, let's try this one more time. Aha. One second. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, 
So the, the controlled strategy I described to you, it's, it, it's, it's really, I, I call it pathetically simple. I mean, so, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, we could be modeling these things with, you know, somehow when I was working on this problem, I felt like I should be modeling these things with advanced differential equations. And clearly I should be introducing some, some advanced piece of math to solve this problem. Um, however, so, so, so what you're seeing here is, a whole bunch of controllers which are designed on exactly what I just described to you. Okay, so so at this point you actually understand the whole algorithm. Okay, so it's, it, it's uh, and so again design start with the basic wind up toy strategy, um, introduce some notion of the vertical, and then introduce the simple feedback rule. And so so the, and then so by by playing. Uh, by playing with the open loop, uh, by playing with the wind up toy part of the motion, um, what you can, okay, I bumped the slides in. So by playing with the, with the uh, open loop, uh, by playing with the, the open loop part of the motion, you can design uh, all these different kinds of motions. And so the, the nice thing about this is, is not only do you get a feedback strategy for walking, but you also get a feedback strategy, for example, the, the, the strange kind of, uh, is it a Cossack jump or I don't know, whatever it was doing. Um, so so the same, um, those same mechanisms will work to provide feedback for, for all these other uh, different versions of the task. All right, so let's move on to 3D. So, so a basic question you can ask is, oh, well, you know, does it work in 3D? And uh, the answer, of course, is yes. So, 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 so this is just a simple example of, of a 3D model and so, the kinds of things you can do with these simple models is, is now you can introduce some things into the environment. So these are just some heavy boxes, and it stumbles and and, and it recovers in in, uh, uh, in 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 a fairly natural way, which which comes for free as as emergent behavior from these models, right? And so so if we can make these models a little bit more realistic, so so if we can tune the remaining parameters so that the motion is uh, uh, starts to look uh, just a little bit more like motion capture data, then we're doing well because we, we, we've really defined this, this kind of large uh, sweet spot for these uh, for the control. So you can also play all, all, all other kinds of fun games with this. So we call this the the drunken motion test, right? So uh, so he's carrying a teapot because he's a, he's a graphics uh, uh, the, the graphics. The teapot is, of course, an icon of graphics. So, so, so what we're doing here is we're just experimenting with the vestibular system. So remember, this, this, the character has a notion of which way is up. So what we're doing is we're changing where it thinks gravity is coming from. We're just giving it a slow sinusoidal alteration. Right? We're just slowly messing with, with which way it thinks is up. The real direction of gravity is staying fixed here. All right? And so uh, it, just to show you, you know, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, it, 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 anyhow, so uh, there you go. Don't try this at home, uh, kids. <laughs> Maybe some of you have. Mm. Uh, all right, so, um, so that's, uh, that, that's, uh, um, that's what you can do with a simple model. So, so, so far, this simple model actually has no notion of learning at all. So one thing we can do is we can start to add some notion of anticipation uh, into the model. And so, um, so right now, what's happening is, is every joint is being driven by what's called a, a proportional derivative controller. So basically, if I specify a target angle, there's some virtual spring and damper, which is used to, to, to compute the torque that, that takes it to that desired target angle. And so as I move these desired target angles around, the actual arm follows this with, with some delay. All right? And so, um, but, but this is always reacting and not anticipating. And you say, surely when we do motions, we actually anticipate what's coming ahead. Right? So, so let's add a bit of anticipation to this model. And so, so the conventional framework for doing this is, is to add some kind of inverse model um, such, a, such as what we see here. And so, so if you have a really good inverse model, that means you, um, what you could do is you give it a desired trajectory the inverse model tells you exactly what torques you need to do to, to produce that trajectory, and, 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 then, and then that runs through your simulation to produce your trajectory. So this, this, this box would exactly be the inverse of, of this box, right? This box goes from trajectories to torques, and then the simulation goes from torques back to trajectories, and if we could compute you know, this magic box, then, uh, then we, we would be in, in, in business. Um, however, okay, so, so, so uh, um, there are ways of, of constructing these boxes with, with, uh, with 
inverse dynamics. However, inverse dynamics and, and tools like that, the, the, they require a, complete, a fairly complete model of the entire, uh, of the entire biped. And, and, um, uh, so so, so what, what we're going to do is actually do something much simpler. So we'll actually just model, again, we'll, we'll, we'll play this simple trick of modeling the motion just as a function of time or, or, or a, as a function of a phase of the motion. And so uh, at some point when, when you do, um, um, and so, yeah, it, and so this particular model uh, as to what you need to execute as a function of phase um, is actually very simple to learn. And so, uh, so I, I won't go into the actual details of, of, of this learning mechanism here. But, but, but the, so the nice thing about this is, is now you can have a feed-forward predictive path, which actually produces most of the, the torques that you need to produce the motion. And then you still want to keep the uh, you still want to keep these uh, controllers in here um, to deal with uh, to deal with some perturbations and some parts of the motion that, that you won't necessarily have fully predicted. Um, so you keep these in the loop, but with much lower gains. And so so um, so again, we, we have this notion of when you're first starting to do a motion, you can rely completely on these. And so this is like. This is a, you're, you're, you've never snowboarded in your life, and your friends, you, and your friends take you to to the uh, to the top of uh, Whistler, and they say, "Here's your snowboard. Here, go to it." And then, so at first, when you do that, you're probably uh, moving in a very stiff fashion. So that would correspond to simply using this type of uh, local control, and then gradually, as you learn to anticipate the, the different aspects of the motion, uh, you bring in more of, of this type of component. Um, all right. Um, so th th that's one form of incremental learning. Let me show you about another form of incremental learning, wh wh which again is, is, is surprisingly simple and, and works surprisingly well. So um, let's say I want to learn. So I know how to walk, but it, it'd be nice if my, if my character could walk upstairs. That would be nice. Uh, it'd be nice if I could actually just, if I could, if I could learn how to step up on, onto really tall objects. So that might be. Uh, a reasonable thing to go after because I've already got I've got a really good walking controller, and so the question is, is, is how can we how can we change that into something that can do a wider variety of things? So um, we we'll, we we'll apply a, a set of techniques called continuation methods, and so uh, the idea is, is really simple. Here's the idea: begin with something you know how to do, that's walking, and slowly change it into into what you really want to do. Right? So so here we go. So we know how to walk. So eh. You know, that's probably not too hard. I, I, I could do that if I know how knew how to walk, right? So, well, okay, if you know how to do this, well, then that's not too hard. So, well, if you know how to do that, well, let's go on to that. Why not, right? And so, so you slowly want to change the uh, morph the problem into into what you want to solve. And so, you're taking advantage of the fact that you, we we have a really good solution over here with with a regular walk, and if we can slowly morph it into this problem. Then we're in business. So, so here's the abstract view of the problem. So let's think of this step climbing problem. Each step is defined by the, there are some underlying control parameters in your, in your controller. So, 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 so this is an abstract diagram. This vertical axis corresponds to, to the parameters. So, so theta here is really a vector of 10 parameters, say. So the, um, the 10 parameters that I do for a normal forward step um, are right here on this diagram. So this climbs a step of height 0. And uh, the horizontal axis here is the step height. And so what I'd like to learn is how do I change my stepping parameters to climb taller steps. So I want to move to the right in this diagram. And the question is, is how should I change, how should I move in this parameter space? The, uh, these blue regions are regions where are, are, are failure regions, and so basically, if I try to climb up on this desk and and I do this, you know, it's not high enough, I fall. Um, anyhow, they're, they're, and, and these failure these failure regions are actually actually dominate the this landscape because trust me, there there are 10 million ways for your characters to fall or for your robot to fall, and and there's there's there are relatively fewer ways for it to do the right thing. So um, we're going to use what's called a predictor corrector method, and so um, so given a initial starting point, this knows how to climb a zero centimeter step. Use those parameters. Suppose someone told you, look, to climb a five centimeter step, not hard. You just tweak your parameters in this way, 
and then you climb, you, you can step on a phone book, right? So, um, so one, uh, one of the most logical ways to, 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 um, to, to say, oh, well, how could I step on something higher is to simply do linear ex extrapolation from that. So, so that's the prediction step for your predictor corrector method. And so uh, what we'll do is, is we'll, we'll establish what's called a trust region. So we'll, um, we'll try to predict as far ahead as we can. So if doing linear extrapolation from a five centimeter step to a, what is this? This is maybe one meter, to a one meter step. If that works, great, I'm happy with that, I, I'm in business. Um, if it doesn't work, then, then I, I, I'll just do a line search um, along this direction. To, to go, I'll go as far as I can which is up to uh, that point. And then, uh, well, so, so the problem here is, is, is this motion works in the circle there. It works, but, but it barely works. And so, so basically, we, we, you wanna, uh, we wanna optimize the motion again so that it, uh, um, so that it works in, in, in as reliable a fashion as possible. And so, so that's an optimization step. And, and then we go on, right, so, so now, um, I know how to climb my five centimeter step, and I know how to climb my 20 centimeter step, say, and we'll, we'll go on. Um, all right, so, so some idea of what the parameters are that are being optimized. They, they basically relate to, to the joint angles at various points in time. Um, but this is, so let me just sh show you some of the results, right? So if you, if you just give this thing a step, well, it, it falls. No, no rocket science there. Um, so I, I'm not showing you all the intermediate steps of the solution process, but um, but so so one of the really neat things is is with this algorithm is is I never told it at all how to climb this step. I gave it no information about how to climb that tall step. So so this really was uh, a, a simulation running overnight, and it's doing this optimization to um, automatically to figure out how to climb tall steps. So so that's kind of neat, right? I, I in the in the evening I gave it a walking step. And in the morning, you wake up, and, and now it knows how to climb tall steps, right? With, without having you, and so uh, without having told it anything. So, so we haven't explicitly told it uh, to watch out for collisions between the feet. Between the feet, we haven't explicitly told it, um, oh, to climb a to climb a tall step. You know, it's really good. What you what you need to do, what you need to do is you need to step here and then pitch your body or up your body forward so that your center of mass is over your new foot. So, so we haven't told it, and that emerges um, as a behavior. Um, so you can do the same thing for stepping over objects. Uh, so again, um, you start with walking. And so, well, stepping over an object, that's, it's, it's just another version of walking, right? So, um, so again, what, what, again, what's neat here is, is we haven't given it uh, the actual strategy. Um, there is actually a random component in climbing that over that first centimeter step, and so what you'll notice for this one is that it, it swung, you know, for some of these steps swing sideways to get the leg over, and then some of the steps lift directly over. And so uh, what's interesting is, 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 of course, if for the first adaptation it swings the leg sideways to go over the um, to, to go over the obstacle, then it will continue to, to, to follow that particular strategy. And so th this is like you uh, having a bad golf swing, and then now your golf instructor says, oh, well, now you need to hit it further. You will probably continue to have a bad golf swing and try to hit it further with that, with that bad mode. Um, so, so, so this gets stuck in particular um, styles of doing things, and, uh, but I, I would argue that that's not necessarily unrealistic. Um, okay, so you, see you can learn how to push objects as well. Okay, so this is, the, this is just the walking algorithm. And, it, and it, it, you know, think of it with its eyes closed and it just runs into this thing and it says, I don't know what to do. What do I do? Um, so, uh, and so what you can do is you can gradually adapt it. So you say, well, let's push a one kilogram um, object. Let's push a two kilogram object. And, and, there's, and there's friction here. So, so as the weight of the object goes up, it needs to push harder and harder. And so, uh, so that's kind of neat, right? So now, just from, just from the simple walking algorithm, it can now climb steps, step over things, walk up various slopes. I haven't shown you that one. Um, and, uh, and it can push things, right? And so, so it, 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 you know, in some, in some crude sense, it, it's, it's learned that it has to lean into the object. Uh, that's probably not a good way to, to, move, your, to move your most valuable possessions, uh, but. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, so, so one other thing that I haven't mentioned is, is once you get to the end point of your learning process, 
you take your end parameters and you take your starting parameters and if you do linear interpolation for a lot of these problems linear interpolation between your end point and your starting point actually works for most of these problems and so, so we, which was kind of a su surprising thing so, so with the right representation a lot of these problems are surprisingly linear All right. okay so um, let's see well, what else could we do with these controllers well uh, we, we've, we've kind of tuned them to do certain parameterized motions. Something else we could do is, is, is we could just do straight sequencing. We could say, uh, okay, I, I have the walking forward controller. Well, okay, so, so I might have one controller that will just walks. This, this guy just steps in place. This guy walks forward. This guy runs forward. And then I have a fourth controller, which uh, th this one will walk backwards. So um, then what, I, what, I, what we'll do here is is we'll come up with a um, uh, with a strategy for selecting which of these four controllers to use to, to walk to this line as quickly as possible. So that would be the name of the game. So 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 so, so this is the um, the, the control policy here. We'll, we'll simply discreetly select one of these controllers. And so so not but by the way, not all not all of these controllers can successfully tr transition to each other. You can imagine that if I'm running. And, and, and someone throws the switch and says, oh, please start walking backwards now, and, and just starts using the walking backwards controller, um, you can imagine that, that it will fall simply because the, 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 uh, the basin of attraction for that particular walking backwards controller um, has, uh, is limited. All right, so um, here's some of the, so, so, so here's the way you can, you can com compute some of these control policies. Um, you start at a good state, so, so, so this, might be, this might be simply standing still. Then you apply the walking forwards controller, the, the walking backwards controller, and the in place controller maybe. So, let, so let's say, just say you have those three controllers. Um, and, and each arc here represents one step. Okay? So, so we're discretizing it not only in terms of control actions, so the, the controllers are discrete here, so it's a very abstract version of, of your action space. Um, but we're also discretizing it in, in time, so, so we're, we're going to do one step at a time. So um, if I simulate forward uh, for, for two steps, so, so, so we'll, build this, we'll just build a large search tree. So I'm just going to exhaustively explore all possible sequence of actions starting from this state. So that's a big tree. And what I'm going to do is, is if I get to a state that's too far away from my starting state, so I, I will introduce some kind of distance metric. And, and if I get too far away, so my definition of too far away is defined by, by this blob here, but it's really just a, dis, a distance metric. So, so think of this, this blob as, I should have drawn it as, as a sphere, basically. Um, if you go outside of that sphere, you say, ah, I'm not interested, we'll count that as a failure, please don't go there. Um, if, you, if you end up at a similar state to where, you, to where that you've already reached through other means, so you started at this state, you did one step forward and one step backwards with the backwards controller, and you end up at a state that's pretty similar to if you did, if you did some other sequence of controllers. Well, then we can terminate, uh, we can terminate uh, this branch. Um, anyway, so, so we just continue this process until everything is, has been terminated. Um, so, so there's still a few open leaf nodes here. That guy is open, and this one, and, and that one. But, but you can imagine, um, I, I, um, I can achieve, I, I can, uh, if, I make the, if I make this region small enough, then, then I can restrict it to, to, to just doing small scale exploration of, of these different motion primitives. Um, so now, it, now in order to solve a task, what we can do is, okay, our task is to walk to this line, and I, and I have this, this uh, space here that models the, the dynamics of all possible transitions. Uh, and so I, I can instantiate that at, at different points in the domain and I can apply dynamic programming in this kind of abstract high dimensional space. Um, the, and, and so one of the reasons why this works is, is because we, we're actually working with, with a, a distance metric on this high dimensional space and, and not just some, some high dimensional grid. Um, but the, um, so, so what this gives you in the end is, um, is the following. So, so the goal of this bird here is just always to, to walk towards the green dot there, the, the, the green square. And so, um, let me just restart that. 
Okay, so, 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 so this is actually a, a little game platform that we built. So, so this runs in real time. The, um, again, this bird, is, it's always desperately trying to go to, the, to, to, go to, to, go to this location. Um, you, you can throw things at it. You can do, um, oops, uh, sorry, I should have. Uh, let me just run this one more time. All right. So, uh, right. So, so one of the things that that's going on is is now because we, we're working with, we've now integrated a family of controllers, and when you integrate a family of controllers, it's actually more robust than any of the individual controllers. And so, um, so one of the reasons for that is because if you have a walking forward controller and, and you give it a giant backwards push, it's doing this, and it says, I, I. So the walking forwards controller, that will be a failure mode for the walking forwards controller. If you have a set of integrated controllers, basically you're walking forward, it's receiving, it receives a large push, it's now in this state. And now if you have, if you have a, a collection of controllers to, to choose from, and one of those controllers is a walking backwards controller, then your walking backwards controller says, hmm, that, that's funny, the state that I find myself in is exactly like the one that, uh, that I've already seen typically when I walk backwards. And so, um, so you can take advantage of, of, of the, uh, the, the basin of attraction of, of each of these controllers uh, by themselves. Um, all right. So now, uh, I, one of the reasons for, for talking about the, this particular project is just to, just to, um, to describe how many layers are in this kind of control architecture that, that, that ultimately is behind that, that little bird creature, right? So, so at the bottom level, we have torques which drive the simulation, right? And, and at the top level, we have, we have the character state coming in. So where is the bird? Is he falling to the right? Uh, what's its velocity? And, and, and where is the point that it should walk to? So in principle, if I put this in a big black box, this big black box does compute some kind of mapping from the state what state is the bird in to, to exactly what it should do for every joint torque, right? That's the big box if, if you could shrink wrap it somehow. Um, however, once you open it up, basically that it just has these many different layers uh, inside. So, so there's, a, there's a proportional derivative controller layer which, which drives the motion with these kind of compliant uh, actuators. Um, then there's this layer of controllers which uh, one for walking forwards, one for walking backwards, et cetera. So there's a collection of these. And, and then moving up one level in the hierarchy is, is, is this control policy, which, is, which, uh, which selects between these controllers. And so, um, so, um, anyway, so, so, so this is an argument for, for building these things incrementally, um, as well, and, and, and uh, including them, including um, uh, modeling them as, as uh, building hierarchies around these things. All right. So uh, let, let's look on to. Uh, so I'd now like to um, to talk about one more uh, improvement for, uh, on this architecture. So so the, the basic locomotion strategy that I showed you um, uh, does not extend very well to different characters and to so 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 if I if I change the height or mass of one of my characters then the, this early strategy that I described to you, it will actually start to break. So, so there are parameters that you need to tune. So, so now I'd like to, to describe to you an architecture with that, that doesn't have any parameters that, that you need to tune. And so uh, it's gonna, it's gonna, it'll be able to do a whole bunch of different things. So here are some of the abstract components that you need for that. So, so it, it looks fairly similar, actually. So, so underneath, the, 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 there's a motion generator, which basically controls a bunch of trajectories over time. All right, so, so we'll have a bunch of joint angles, which we will control either in local coordinates, those are the orange ones. So the elbow here is just trying to do its local thing with respect to its parent link. Um, and, and then we have some joints such as that, that this neck joint, it knows which way is up. And so it's trying to, to uh, maintain a target angle with respect to uh, a global coordinate frame. So we're gonna have that. We're, we're gonna have, a, a, uh, instead of having the, these two gain constants, which which use position and velocity to decide where to change where, where you step. Um, we'll, we'll do the same, we'll do a similar thing, but we'll accomplish that with an inverted pendulum model, right? So that if, if, if your inverted pendulum is moving with this velocity, then what we want to compute D 
So, so D represents the distance of where you, where you want to step such that when the pendulum comes to, such that um, the pendulum will be at rest, either at rest or going at the right velocity uh, um, once, it, uh, once the center of mass is, is over the foot. Anyhow, so it's a simple prediction model of, of where to step. And uh, you know, th th this is not rocket science here, right? So kinetic energy plus potential energy is, is both, is, should be the same before and after in, in these two states. Um, and so, so from this, you can get a formula for, for D, this distance D, as to where you need to step. Um, OK, so, so, so we'll, we'll use that as a simple abstract component. Um, we're going to do one more thing. So, so gravity is a, uh, is, is, a, is a surprisingly strong force in, uh, in most motions. And particularly for slow motions, if I'm just moving slowly, gravity is, is, is the dominant force for, for every part of my motion. And so if you can come up with a way to, to cancel out the effect of gravity, then, then um, uh, th that's actually a great predictive model for, for what you need to do, even just to maintain a given pose. Right? If I want to stand here like this, I have to predict what should my muscles be doing to, to, to hold that pose. Um, so, so, so this is actually, uh, so, so you can do this in, in a simple way um, uh, using what's called the, 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 Jacobi, the Jacobian transpose. Anyway, so the, the Jacobian basically uh, relates forces to, to torques in these models. Um, all right. Um, right, okay, so, so, so we can also, uh, there's also one more component which we can use to, to regulate the velocity. So, and so, if I want to accelerate forward slightly, one, one yeah, okay, um, what's the best way to phrase this? To, if I want to come to a stop, there's different ways I can do this. One way is to simply take a larger step and then come to a stop. Another way is actually to, as I, as I start a step, I can shift my weight immediately to the front of my toes and then, uh, um, so I'm not changing where I step, but I'm changing my, where my ground reaction forces are placed. And so it turns out you can also get that for free um, with, with the same Jacobian transpose model. So, so uh, uh, it will give you exactly that kind of effect. You give it a desired velocity. Uh, uh, you use an error in velocity to compute a desired force you want to apply to the center of mass. And, and you get exactly this kind of effect. Um, all right. So, the, uh, I don't want to spend any time on this diagram, but, but th this diagram basically integrates the, those four pieces that, that I just spoke to you about. Um, and so, so these are these abstract templates. Uh, so that, uh, that ideally should help with multiple tasks, right? And so the, um, so I'll be showing you a whole bunch of animations. All of these animations use, uh, use exactly the same architecture. And so, 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 so there's no parameters to tune for any of these animations. Um, there's absolutely no learning in this model. Okay, so, so, so the fun thing is, for example, if you want to script a, uh, a motion that leans backwards like this and a motion that leans forward like that, again, the, 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 inverted, the uh, inverted pendulum model will simply capture all of the desired effects that, that you need to, to correctly control the balance for all these things. Um, I'll just... Uh, Get the lights here because this is a bit dark. Uh, let's see. Some, uh, oops. All right. Ho hopefully that's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So so now you can let your kids design physics-based motions, right? So so again, all, all of these motions, I, I can give you the forces. I can give you the ground reaction forces and the torques at every time step. Uh, all of this stuff runs in real time, and so. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's, so so the, this is so it just lives in a much more flexible point in the design space than something uh, that, that, than what we've typically seen so far in terms of humanoid robots and, and other kind of character uh, physics-based character animation uh, work. So, for example, if we want a you know if we have other things, other skills. So again, all of this is layered just on top of a walking skill, but now. We can simply have a high-level script um, that, that says, oh, just duck a bit when you get, when you get to this point, just duck a bit, and, and oh, when you get close to one of these obstacles, lift your foot a bit more. 
Um, and the balance just all takes care of itself. So, um, and again, so, so, so the model behind this is, is, is ultimately not terribly uh, complicated. Um, we can, you can push and pull stuff. So, uh, so the, these are, um, I like these examples just because they, they, they are examples where, where, you, where the, the force clearly plays, plays a role and, and the balance is, is just, uh, it's just, just very visible. Um, yeah, you can push and pull stuff. You can, um, what else can you do? Uh, again, so now we're not just doing walking. So, so in principle, uh, the, yeah, so, so, so this thing can, can pick up objects placed at, at any height, uh, et cetera. So, uh, so, so the characters are starting to be you know, much more skillful, right? And so, um, so obviously one of, the few, one of the big future directions here is, is to run all this stuff. I, I want to run all this on, on a humanoid robot, right? And so, uh, because all of these are physically correct trajectories. And so, so uh, and, and, and again, it's a single model that's underneath this. And, and because it's constructed from the right pieces, so again, coming back to this notion of motion of vocabulary, um, it can really do many things without, any, without requiring any, any further learning, right? So the, uh, all right, so, oh, so, okay, so, so we can carry a, a heavy crate. So, so what's ha what happens here, when he picks up the crate, um, as soon as he touches the crate, then we, we, be, then we add the, the um, we add the mass of the crate. Uh, we, we effectively bind the hands to the crate. And so, and, and so what, ha what happens immediately is that because of the, um, because the crate now effectively becomes part of the, the body schema of the character, and it's actually part of the body. And so um, then the control algorithms know how to compensate the motion for the weight of the crate. So you can, do, uh, you can do crazy things here. You can have, uh, you can, you can, uh, so, so, so Steli and I told him, oh, we should do some character. Let's see how well your simulation works with, with multiple characters. And so, 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 so the, uh, the, the interesting thing here happens, yeah, okay, so, so see, it happens right here. So, so this, this uh, the guy in the yellow shirt will step on this tall guy's foot, right? And so, so then he will trip and stumble backwards and he'll stumble into this guy, the big guy back there. Yeah. Oops, okay, so, so, so now that you know what to watch for, let's run that again. All right, so step, stumbles, he bumps into the guy. Anyhow, so, so um, and just in terms of actual application of this work, this, is, this now starts to get into the realm of things that, that people in, in, in the film and visual effects industry are, are more interested in because now you can, you can animate potentially uh, large crowds, particularly large, large crowds of animals. And so we'll, I'll show you animals in a second. Here's an animal. Um, uh, so now if you have a crowd of dogs running up the hill and all bouncing into each other um, with the right kind of underlying cont control architecture, all of that will, will in principle take care of itself. Martha, yeah. turn on the light? Oh, sorry. OK. Yeah. I, yeah. Let me, uh, let's do that. Uh, thank you. All right, so uh, how's that? Is that good? Okay, great. Okay, so so the last thing we've applied this to is uh, is a uh, quadruped model. So um, so so we're really excited by this model. Let me just go straight to the video just just to show what it can do. The um, the key thing is, is that this is constructed from from the same types of control components as uh, as what I just uh, uh, as what I have been speaking about. So, uh, so let's get this going here. All right, so we, we can now have a physics-based uh, dog which can jump and, and do a variety of things. Any good physics-based dog worth its, worth its weight has to be able to sit, right, of course. Um, all right. So, so let me just talk over this while, while this is running. Um, one of the things that we give as input is we give it a, an initial gait graph. Okay, so, so we can get some data from real dogs which say for a trot gait, for a walking gait, uh, when, are, when are the feet on the ground and when are they in the air? Okay, so, so, so that's a basic input parameter. Um, and uh, yeah, and so, so in terms of incremental design or development of these controllers, um, the, yeah, uh, the, the um, we follow the same strategy here. So, so the first thing that, that this dog tries to do when he's walking is he just tries to walk in place, okay, in a stable fashion. 
Then once you know how to, then once we have the parameter, once the optimization procedure has found a good walk for walking in place, we'll optimize, we'll further optimize the parameter set for, for walking at, uh, at uh, half a meter per second. Then we'll walk at one meter per second, et cetera. And so again, if, if you find yourself with the right components and a good starting point in some parameter space for these controllers, uh, you, you can really take these controllers, uh, you can really go quite far. Um, one of the components you can use in order to get more realistic gates is you can actually get some, get some motion data from real dogs. So, so we did that. This is from our, our partners at uh, INRIA in, uh, in France. Um, and so, uh, so we are tuning these gates. We are placing virtual motion capture markers on our simulated dogs. And one of the parameters in the optimization says, please try to match what the real dog does okay, in terms of motion. All right. Um, so the dogs can it, it, can can walk up and down uh, variable terrain, can trot over variable terrain. A, a basic question to ask here is is what does the dog know about the terrain? H how far ahead can it see? Um, the short answer is when a leg is is raised in the air and it needs to plan where to step, we give it the height of the terrain. Uh, in, of where, it, uh, of where it will step. Uh, all right, so uh, if time were, if I had a bit more time, I would run the real-time demo because all, all of this stuff runs in real time. So, so, so this dog is made out of uh, around 30 rigid articulated bodies. Uh, again, so, so the, we're simulating the physics at about 2,000 time steps per second. I can give you all the ground reaction forces, all the torques, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, so, so you can now have this, uh, this basic, uh, yeah, the simulated quadruped, um, which, which you, can, you can do all the basic quadruped gates, um, and, uh, and you can push it around. And let's see here. You'll see that, 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 that yeah, this dog has a, it has a flexible back, and so uh, you, you, um, I'll show you at the end. There's a, uh, a clip that shows you the, the effect of the flexible back. Um, we, we've also built a parameterized uh, jump controller. Uh, th this one, it, it, you know, if you look at real dogs, they don't quite jump like this. So, so, so this is this is probably. Uh, it, it is a motion for which we didn't have any reference data, and so. Um, but the um, we, we are building th through automatic optimization. We're, bu we're building a parameterized jump. So jumps have a have a height, and and they have a distance. So 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 that you can think of there being a two two dimensional table of jumps for different heights and different distances. Um, but there's also your, your starting velocity. Also matters, and so it, there's really a three-dimensional function here. So height, velocity, and distance, and, and we, uh, we produce parameterized motions in in that space. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll anyhow, you can you can do a bunch of stuff. Let, let, let me uh, let me just uh, move forward to the uh, conclusions because I'm running a little bit over. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, okay, so so I basically talked over. This is a series of, of uh, I guess there's five different uh, five different SIGGRAPH papers that, that this covers. Uh, we presented these at Dynamic Walking. You know, there's a lot more information on these uh, available online. Um, back to the core message. So uh, you can do uh, you can do a whole lot with with incremental development uh, or, or incremental uh, learning. Uh, for these control strategies. Uh, you're a lot better off uh, including time somewhere in your controller parameterization and, and not just state. And ideally, it's, so uh, both the dog and the human character, they, they really made use of, of, of certain abstract templates that the controller was constructed on. And so, that, the, and so that's what I'm really selling here as, as our uh, motion vocabulary. 
And so once you have that vocabulary, you can use optimization to do all kinds of interesting um, uh, incremental development. Um, so uh, often when you work in this area, uh, there's, a, there's all kinds of work on, on all kinds of optimal control. And so, so um, we use optimization to, to produce a lot, of, to tune a lot of our motions. However, there, we, we really don't do anything in terms of optimizing for energy and uh, those kinds of things. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so, so the learning and the feedback is actually distributed across multiple time scales uh, if you look carefully at, at this control architecture. Um, well, just one basic comment. On, uh, you might think for these kinds of problems that uh, if I could just collect enough data of how dogs walk and how people walk, then, then wouldn't that give me, let me construct a, a, a good control system? And so, so my, my answer to this is, 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 is well, maybe you could, but, but it's hard. Because it's really difficult to, uh, it, I can collect as much data as I want from, from this kind of simulation. Uh, but it, it's really difficult to go from that data back to the control architecture, which, which would have produced it. Uh, all right, so there's many, many things that we want to do for future work, uh, many more skills. Um, we want to do horses, elephants, uh, robots, and um, you know, eventually we want to have download, downloadable skills uh, on the web, right? So, so you have your you have your robot or your or your intelligent character, and today you might you might down you might download texture maps, right? And in, in the uh, in the future, well, you might download actual skills. Um, many students have uh, and colleagues have have worked on this. These are uh, these are. Their names, so let me stop right there and, and go to questions. Thanks. And it, it, if you do have to go, I, I completely understand. So, uh, right, I'm just uh, a little bit late. So, yeah, uh, Holger. It sounds rather intuitively <coughs> that optimization is somewhere at the heart of doing many of the things that you were talking about. Yep. Um, and I'm sort of wondering about two things. I mean, first of all, how do you actually do that, that optimization? And secondly, you know, is, is that currently a bottleneck or is it just you use any old method and it works because the problems aren't very hard? Yes, yeah, I know. So, so, so I didn't get into the specific optimization technique. You, you'll, you'll be happy to know we're using stochastic local search for a lot of these things. Uh, in, in practice, for many of these problems, we, we have found that, 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 that they're, they're well posed enough that, that, uh, that any old method will just about work. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so, so it, it is, it is uh, one of the things that we haven't spent time on is, is efficiently paralyzing those. Uh, and so, 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 so that, that would certainly be something where, where we could use your help. <laughs> Yes, yeah, right there. You come from a completely different background. Sure. Most people uh, in technical engineering, you need to know. Um, it's been a while since I studied biomechanics, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the inverted pendulum model doesn't tend to translate itself to bipedal running. Right, right. So how, are, are you planning on, on addressing that in some way? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, so, so for running, a uh, common model is the, 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 there is actually kind of a spring-loaded inverted pendulum model, and so that's a variation which has been used for, for, for running. Um, it is true that, that yeah, so, so one open question is, is, let's say I do have motion capture data and, and I, and I want to use that to tune the motion. And so, so um, sometimes, uh, so for the dog, that worked quite well. Uh, for, for the human, we, 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 for the human model, we found that, that it takes more effort or they, it, it seems to be more finicky in terms of tuning it to get it to do exactly the right thing. Particularly, for example, um, one, of the pro one of the areas where these models start to have problems is, is uh, or start to be more problematic is for the, the foot contact. And so really getting the ankle to, to do the right motion, et cetera. Um, so so that, there are definitely many components of these models which, which need a whole lot more work. And so, uh, so far, the, the major thrust has, has, you know, really is to say, Look, we're, we're, you, even with with this relatively unsophisticated, ultimately these relatively unsophisticated, unsophisticated and, 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 and flexible components, you could already do so much. And then, so you know, that even you know, get a gate working first, and, and then tune it in whatever direction you want. 
And so th this is to contrast with the, uh, uh, there's a community called Dynamic Walking. So, so at, at many of you might know at, at SFU, they, um, they're, they've been well known for, for designing passive walkers, right? So, so a passive walker is just, a, is just a, a walker that has no actuation at all, and if you place it on a narrow, on a, on a, on a shallow incline, it just walks all by itself. And so uh, th that's another starting point for studying walking. You can say, well, let's just, let's just uh, study the passive motion and, and then actuate it afterwards. And then so, uh, so um, th there's interesting conversations that, that, that we've had with people in the dynamic walking community because they, they can get that stuff working, but then where they have problems is, is actually, uh, you know, my, my first question to them is, oh, you know, it's great that it uses very little energy, but how, how are you going to get it to climb up a step? How are you going to get it to do any of these other motions that I was showing you? And so, so it, it, there's an interesting philosophical question. Do, do, do you start with focusing on that optimal walk and, and then tune it for robustness, or do, you, or do you start at the other end and you say, look, let's just build a general thing, and then I can always, I can always tune this for, for energy optimality. And so, and in fact, that, that's also in the future work list is like, how do we do that? And, and, um, and the nice thing about, about that is, is you, again, we can experiment with form versus function in, in biology, right? So, so why, you know, can an elephant walk more or less in efficiently if you increase the length of the legs, et cetera, et cetera. And so now, we, you, the nice thing about this is you have a concrete model for experimenting with all these things. And, and to our knowledge, the, 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 there's no other, um, the, there really is no other 3D model for, for quadruped motion in the world that, that does anything near uh, what we're showing here. So, so we're really excited about that. Yeah. So you mentioned something about how like real kids learn how to walk. Um, when your models are learning how to do something, does it actually look like sort of real things learning, or is it quite different even on the end result? Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, a, a lot of these things are, are, are just us giving it a very specific uh, curriculum, right? So we're, we'll say, oh, first we'll learn how to climb a, a small step then climb a larger step. So, so a, lo a lot of it is, is kind of scripted. And so in, in that way, it, it, it's, it's very much as you might expect, right? So, so, so the same thing for the dog. We'll say, walk slowly. OK, now walk a bit faster, et cetera, right? And so uh, uh, in terms of other, uh, yeah, so, so, so w w one of the problems we're not currently tackling is that it, it, it is the, 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 the discovery problem. So if you really have two completely different modes of doing a motion, it won't discover a new mode, right? So it will always try to exploit whatever mode it currently has. So you know, the, the classic example of different modes is for the high jump, right? So, so for many years, people did, uh, would do a, a scissor kick, I think, was the optimal way to, to jump over a high bar. And then uh, Ray Fosbury, I know, the, the, uh, Fosbury introduced the Fosbury flop, who said, no, 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 what you need to do is you need to run and throw yourself backwards over the bar, and you know, you know, God knows how, it, how he came up with that idea, and, uh, um, but so, uh, th this is an example of, of where the, where the design space is not smooth, and, um, and where, uh, where ultimately, yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I, th I think you, you might need some, some kind of qualitative physical models as opposed to quantitative, right? So, so I, I, I think if you do have a, a qualitative understanding of motion, you can say, oh, well, maybe I could push really hard and maybe I could, anyhow. So, um, yeah, it's an open question. Yeah, Bob. Just in interest of historical accuracy, um, that high jump you're talking about was actually pioneered by Debbie Brill, who's local. Oh, really? We're okay. Doing okay. women's high jumping, and what you described is the Fosbury flaw. And the issue before that was not optimality, but the rules required the feet to go over the jump first. So they had to have a rule change to allow that head going over, back going over first to be permitted. And that eventually happened when people discovered that you could actually go higher. Oh, really interesting. OK, and OK. The original jump is usually called the Western roll. Right, right. OK. No, thanks for that. Yeah, no, great, great. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. Joanna, yeah. So you were mentioning near the end that this is almost at the stage where you know the animation, you know, outfits and all that can see incorporating it. 
Can you give us some idea of what they're going to need to do to take your work and plug it into their tools? Like yep. how much tweaking, like what would I have to do as, a, as an animator today to be, be able to take advantage of this? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, no, so, so uh, it really depends on, well, okay, so where, where, where I think this will ultimately fit in is, is th there's enough complexity here that, that you need to have some, you need to develop some, some, good, middle, some good middleware right. that, that, that takes this basic engine that we've developed and will add some of the necessary hooks on that, that animators would want to use, right? And so, and so the question is, well, well, what's the right approach to, to go about doing that, et cetera? I mean, so, so uh, um, you know, we, we, we have, um, uh, the, this is also where, where the work with uh, quadrupeds is actually turning out to be of more interest to people than the work with humans uh, or than the work on the human character models because they'll say, oh, well, we can always use motion capture and, and edit that afterwards uh, for modeling human motion. But for, uh, for modeling, for, for modeling uh, the quadrupeds, there's basically, well, it's, it's really hard, really difficult to motion capture. Um, you know, uh, you, you, you can create the motion by hand, and so even, and, and, and that, this has a long tradition, right? So, so even going back to Walt Disney uh, animators uh, animating Bambi, you know, you, you, you might think that, oh my God, they're just all fantastic artists and they can just sit there and imagine deer in their heads. And, and, and that's partly true, but it's also partly true that, that it, it, well, it, it is true that they also, they first study the motion of real deer and they'll bring a deer into the studio and, and, and uh, uh, this is, so they use all kinds of reference footage uh, from the real world directly. And so, uh, so we, need, we need some of that reference footage as well to, to tune our model. Um, other things are, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it, it's really a question of, of control. Um, so the the tricky thing is 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 what's probably most interesting to animators is, is the type of stunt that might be the most difficult for us to do, right? And say, oh well, we want our you know we want our wolf in, in the Twilight series to to run partly up this tree and then arc in his back, whatever, and you know do some rather spectacular stunt. Now, now that's great, but, but in terms of in terms of computing the, the control strategy needed to do that, that that's exactly that's also a weak spot, right? So so we can do um, a lot of the basic interactions and the basic gates and all the basic turning and, and all that stuff. Um, but it, so it depends on on to what extent you want to do um, do these things. Now now it's, 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 I think a, a large, large crowd and herd animation is probably where you, where you see some of this first because A, it's at a distance, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't really matter if you get all the details exactly right. Um, and this kind of model, it'll just give you a lot of the interactions for free. And uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's, I think, a sweet spot. Yeah? Are you guys looking at the, because some of the movements, there's like there's different ways of doing it, right? Which yep. looks different. Are you guys looking at that more specifically? Um, or, I guess, I mean, I'm looking at this from a computer convention perspective. Um, when you have a person run, right? Yep. There's multiple ways that they can do it. Some people get over to some reasons, some people don't. Yep. Is there any, do you think there's sufficient complexity within your model and, I guess, sufficient power to maybe do some predictions on how a person with a particular dimension is going to happen? Right. Is going to Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, so uh, in, in terms of uh, precisely modeling many different variations of, of human motion, uh, that, that we haven't worked at, at that kind of precision control of style yet. We've, okay. we've tried to cover the, the, the broad scale, so, so you, with many of the, you saw many of the, the crazy kinds of, you know, more uh, extremely stylized walks that we could do, right? Um, I think I think what you're talking about is, is more subtle variations, and so um, and and uh, for that, be, be, particularly be, before you you would want to use this model to make any any kind of biomechanical predictions, the, then there is all, all kind of uh, all kinds of uh, parameter fitting that you would want to do uh, 
first, I think, be before you want to get into, into that level of detail. So, so, so I, I wouldn't yet trust this model for, for that level of detail, but, yeah. but we're getting there, right? And so, and so what, what's ultimately different about our model than, than what you're seeing in, bio, in a lot of biomechanics work? In, so a lot of bio, biomechanics work will work with uh, uh, trajectories and, and force trajectories and, and position trajectories of a specific motion. And so what that doesn't give you is it doesn't give you kind of a, a, a real-time model that, that can interact and react, right? And so instead it's a, it's a trajectory that satisfies the physics, yeah. uh, but it, it doesn't tell you, um, you know, if, if I stick a, a, a heavy skew boot on one of these characters, it will just start limping, you know, all on its own, right? And so you get all this emergent behavior so, 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 so that's the kind of thing that's, in, and you can interact with it. And so, uh, so in, in that sense, biomechanics g goes off in in, in, a, in a somewhat different direction. But um, um, and it, the, the other most significant open direction is actually driving these kinds of models, but 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 with a muscle and tendon model, as opposed to currently we just have straight torque-based actuation. So it's as if there were a torque motor at every joint. Well, you know, that's not how you or I are built. Um, however, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that you can take some of these control strategies and, and project them onto, onto a, a muscle-driven actuation space rather than a vector-based. Uh, yeah, Wolfgang. Yeah, that, my question goes into a little bit into that direction. So sure. um, you're building all these skills, or you're learning all these skills relative to a, some simulated reality, which is obviously an abstraction of, of of the real world. So yep. if you change your your physical reality, your simulator, the physical simulator and the way you model the characters and the weight distribution and things like that and, and uh, you know presumably you will have to adapt your um, your uh, your skills or the way the skills are, are described. Yep. So the, the question is um, how do you know with what level of detail you need to describe your physics, um, your physical reality, and also if you were to actually transfer this to a robot at some, at some point, now you're going to have a discrepancy between the physics that you're, that you're modeling and the actual physics that, you know, of the character falling over under, with a real mass distribution in the, in the real, in real accelerations and things like that. Yep. So, so uh, can you say a little bit about the chat? how robust it will be under this and, and just the, basically the modeling challenges for us. Yeah, no, sure. So, 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 um, so, so Stellian, who's done a lot of the work on this, he, he, he has actually worked, uh, get, gotten this running on a, a number of real humanoid robot simulators. And so, and so th that's one way to deal with the problem is to say, oh, you built a robot. Okay, it's up to you to, to model it and build the simulator. And then you give us the simulator and we'll will build you a good controller using that simulator. Um, however, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's a good question, yeah. So, so, so how, how accurate does your model have to be? Um, one, one, of the, one of the surprising things related to the control of, of the human walking is, is basically how, how um, uh, the, yeah, it, basically you, your control strategy is actually, uh, for in order to for basic walking, it's actually not that sensitive to any of the parameters, and so 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 you can, for example, uh, um, if you, you can make one of, you can make the um, one of the feet heavier, and, and so, so 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 you can introduce misestimations basically into your model and see how the model behaves, and and we've done that, and and so so the the surprising conclusion there is basically you actually don't need very accurate models for. It just if your basic goal is just to maintain balance and, and trudge onwards, and so uh, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, I, I might put my shoes on one day, and they might be a little bit heavier or lighter, and 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 you know, it's not as if you, it's not as if the motion is is, is so, so certainly for walking, it's not that finely tuned. Um, so yeah, so. Um, now, for, 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 for other kinds of motions, it, it might well be a lot more sensitive, right? So if I have some open loop uh, throwing motion, and then now you've changed some parameter in my arm, well, um, that's likely to be a lot more sensitive. Any other questions? Yeah, sure, yeah. 
Do you have any plans to introduce the use of arms in your humanoid models, for instance, to facilitate climbing or something like that? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, so uh, the, um, that would be a lot of fun. We, we, we've done some initial experiments with, with a gorilla model. And, and so the, the, where the, the purpose of the gorilla model is, is basically it would let us use both our biped controller and the quadruped controller, right? Because so, so, so gorillas do, do knuckle walking. And, uh, and so, so we would want to have a single model which could transition between them all. And, uh, but, but we're not very far along in that yet. But uh, uh, absolutely, I mean, so uh, another thing we would want to do is, is be able, you know, we should be able to model, you know, what a child does in, in a playground, just clambering around in, in a variety of ways. So uh, um, the, the, the difficulty of the motion depends to some extent on, on how dynamic it is. And so, so if, it's, if it's mostly a relatively slow set of movements, that then it's, then my sense is it's not too difficult, and as it gets to be more dynamic, uh, then then it gets more difficult. It gets to be more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I see uh, Sarah, uh, that, uh, will, will she catch your data just at the Oh, okay. So, so uh, with motion data or without motion data? Oh, well, you start with the motion data, but then right. you also inject some more data after it learned those for, for new movements. Or oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so basically, for the um, for the for most for all the biped motions you saw, there there there, there was actually no no motion data in there. Um, for the for the um, for the quadruped, so for the dog. We actually we had reference data for some of the gates, but not all the gates. And so, so we had it for the the walk and the trot. We did not have motion data for the canter or, or the gallops. And so, so, so the motion data helps, but but, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, the, the the price you could have for for not having motion data is, is is that your motion might look somewhat unnatural or might have some quirk to it, and and then you need to come up with some objective. You will, you know, optimization can help. Uh, optimization is your friend, but but you have to know what it is you want to tune it for, or what you want to optimize for. So. Uh, so help. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So so right at the end of the, uh, I didn't run the quadruped video all the way to the end, but but right at the end, we basically uh, uh, show what what the motion looks like before optimization and after optimization, and and it. it Makes a huge difference, uh, absolutely. Because uh, also in there are our optimization criteria for, for example, for for keeping the head stable. And so uh, it turn it turns out uh, that that quadrupeds they and, and other animals again when 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 they run they keep their head fairly stable. And so if you don't do that, then the mo then the mo the model and the motion looks funny. And so, so that's one example of our, of our criteria, which we throw into the optimization. We say, oh, by the way, please minimize accelerations of the head, uh, as well as some other criteria. And so, uh, I, I skipped over some of the details there, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. All right, other questions? Well, thanks a lot.